Hi, welcome everybody to our second in a series of webinars on how to establish an RDAC in your state. We're happy to have you with us today. We've worked hard to put together a very good panel for you all and hope that you'll find it useful, educational, and helpful today. We have uh, 16 RDACs up and running now, and our goal is to have one in every state. So with your help, we hope to accomplish that, and with our toolkits, hopefully those will bring you the kinds of tools necessary to be able to uh, help accomplish this, if you will. So I wanna say, before I turn it over to our team, a real thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, they include Biogen, Bluebird Bio, Borninger Ingelheim, CSL Bearing, Genentech, Horizon, Sarepta, Takeda, and Vertex. Without your support, we would be unable to have these kinds of events right now and probably would not get to our, our, our number of having an RDAC in every single state. So again, I wanna thank you all very much for your, your continued support. Today's uh, session is gonna focus on legislative activities. So hope you enjoy it, hope you find it useful. With that, I'm gonna flip it over to Elise and let her get the, the program going. So thank you again for being here. Thank you very much, Peter. My name is Elise Patel, and I'm the Western Region State Policy Manager for NORD. And to learn more about all of you joining us today, we would like to begin with a quick poll to find out what state you reside in. So if you don't mind, you'll see a question pop up on your screen here. Feel free to let us know. And unfortunately, I can't see the answers here. I don't know if anybody else can pop in and share a little bit about where everyone's calling in from today. All right, I think we'll move on real quick and we'll try to do another poll later. I'm sorry about that technical difficulty. Um, but again, thank you again for joining us. We're really excited to be sharing information about NORD's Rare Disease Advisory Council work today and how you can help advocate for an R RDAC in your state. NORD launched Project RDAC this past year as a way to help optimize the existing RDACs and also as a way to increase the number of RDACs across the country. And under this initiative, NORD will be providing opportunities for the RDACs to collaborate with one another, as well as providing educational resources to guide RDACs for every step of their journey. So feel free to visit our website, rarediseases.org, and click on our Project RDAC tab. There you will find resources, upcoming events like our coalition meetings that are taking place, and also an interactive state map where you can view the state-specific information. Our NORD policy team is here to support you with all things RDAC, and we welcome you to contact us with any questions along the way at rdac at rarediseases.org. And you will notice that NORD has two state policy regions. I am proud to help support the state efforts in the western half of the United States, and soon you'll hear from my colleague Anissa, who supports the states in the eastern half of the U.S. So for those of you that may be new to RDACs, let's take a quick step backwards to, to discuss why they started and the value that they bring to the rare disease community. As many of you know, 25 to 30 million Americans are living with a rare disease, which breaks down to about one in 10 individuals. And while that's quite a few people directly impacted, we're finding that many lawmakers aren't necessarily aware of the unique challenges that are faced by the rare disease community. And so our solution was to form rare disease advisory councils, where a group of diverse individuals could come together in the rare disease community um, to advise state government. And this is especially important because we know that many of our healthcare decisions are actually made at the state level. And we also see RDACs as an enormous opportunity for the community and legislators 
to come together and partner in a more strategic way on a regular basis. The first council was created in 2015 by some wonderful volunteers and advocates in North Carolina, and since then has gained traction across the country. As you can see from this slide, there are currently 16 states that have passed ARDAC legislation with, with Massachusetts being the last state to do so just a couple of months ago. And much of this progress has happened over the course of the last two years, with 10 governors signing ARDAC legislation into law since 2019. NORD is working with several states actively right now to cr create an ARDAC, and those states are highlighted in orange on this map. And you'll also notice that there are seven states that have had bills introduced so far during this legislative session. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Anissa, who will be providing an overview of our newest toolkit. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Elise. Uh, so NORD strives to guide rare disease advocates through each phase of the RDAC life cycle. NORD's first toolkit focused on building a strong coalition to develop and advance RDACs. This toolkit is a guide to the legislative phase of an RDAC. The toolkit provides tips on the legislative process, suggestions for engaging with lawmakers, and advocacy recommendations for the RDAC coalition. Great. Um, so as mentioned, the first phase of the RDAC life cycle is building a strong coalition of rare disease advocates in your state. After the coalition is built, it's time to focus on getting the legislation introduced and across the finish line. It's important to begin looking for potential RDAC bill sponsors. One of the many benefits of having an RDAC coalition is the existing relationships that some members might have with their lawmakers. After folks have identified lawmakers that they think would be a strong bill sponsor, it's time to make the ask and then confirm their support. It's important to communicate with bill sponsors and have and closely track the bill's process to make sure that the coalition is providing consistent support with those efforts. The next toolkit that will be released will focus on the implementation phase and how to make sure that the RDAC establishment is a success. Next slide. So now I'm going to dive a little bit into the legislative process to give an overview of what you can expect. So it's important to note that each state's government can look very different, but this is an overview of what we typically see. Uh, the first step in the process of a bill becoming a law is the introduction of the bill, which is done by members of the legislature. Uh, after the bill is introduced, it's referred to a committee for further consideration. The committee will then vote on whether to report the bill out of committee and advance it to the floor of the legislative body for consideration and a final vote. If the bill is reported out, it heads to the floor for consideration by the full chamber. If each chamber passes a different version of the bill, the two chambers must re resolve the differences between the versions they pass. States may form a conference committee to work out the variations after the two chambers reconcile the differences between the versions of the bill and each passes the final version. It's then sent to the governor's desk for their signature and hopefully it is signed into law and it is officially enacted. Great. So NORD has created RDAC model bill language. This bill language consists of duties and other aspects that have resulted in successful and high functioning RDACs in several states. However, each state again is of course very different and might have certain priorities or needs in the rare disease community that they want to see addressed through an RDAC. The coalition can work together to tweak the language to better meet the state's needs or interests. You can share the model legislation with potential bill sponsors for their feedback and to address questions that they might have. An important part of the bill is the duty section, which lists the activities the council will participate in to benefit the rare disease patients in their state. Each state can add or tweak the duties section to better meet their needs, uh, but a few duties that we often see in several successful RDACs are having public hearings and soliciting comments from the general public in the state uh, to assist the council with the first year landscape. So it's really important for that state to consistently hear from um, different residents from the rare community on, on what their needs are and to hear their story. Um, research and identify priorities related to treatments and services provided to people with rare diseases. Uh, another duty is to publish a list of existing publicly accessible resources 
on research, diagnosis, treatment, and education um, on the council's website. And it's really helpful for the rare disease community to be able to have a little bit of a one-stop shop on that website to um, find those resources. And uh, finally, a common one is identifying and distributing educational resources for healthcare providers to help recognize and optimize treatment of rare diseases. Um, so this is a snapshot of what you'll see in the toolkit. Um, you'll learn helpful tips on the legislative process and how you and the coalition can be of support during each phase. You'll learn different ways to advocate and engage during legislative efforts. Uh, there will be an overview on how you can work with your coalition to get the legislation across the finish line and a step-by-step -step guide to the legislative process. And then we also included some frequently asked questions. So the toolkit, um, it also provides several other resources that'll help you every step of the way. Um, you'll be able to find social media templates and posts you can use, the RDAC model bill languages in there, um, how to find out who your lawmakers are, uh, how to successfully share your story, examples of action alerts, uh, written testimony examples, a sample op-ed, sample letter of support, um, and that's just to name a few. So. Uh, we are so excited that this toolkit has been released and we hope that it'll support you in this phase of your art act journey so with that i will go ahead and turn it uh, over to rose gallagher great thank you so much anisa hi everybody my name is rose gallagher i'm the associate director of policy here at nord and i'm very excited to introduce our panel today A couple housekeeping items uh, before we start today. First, um, as we go along, please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box. Um, in addition, I'd like to try to uh, try another poll and ask you where you are in your state's RDAC process. So while that's going, I will proceed with uh, introducing our panel. As I said, I'm excited to introduce our amazing panel today to talk about the advocacy process of creating an RDAC. Here with us today, we have Massachusetts State Representative Hannah Kane. We have Jacob Fraker, California Senate staffer for Senator Susan Eggman, the RDAC champion in California. We also have with us two amazing Reaction Network ambassadors who are leading the RDAC process in their state. Julie Raskin of New Jersey, and Mike Hugh of California. Before we proceed with the panel, I'll invite each of them to briefly introduce themselves, share their connection to RARE, and why they wanted to create an RDAC in their state. Representative Kane, let's start with you. Uh, thank you, Rose, and thank you for, for inviting me to be part of this uh, panel today. Uh, we are very excited in Massachusetts to have just passed our RDAC and to be the 16th one in the country. When we started, there weren't any, uh, so we're excited to be 16. Um, I am somebody who has been in the legislature, this is my fourth term, and have, have been very heavily involved in all public health aspects. So I sit as the ranking minority member of, of the Public Health Committee as well as the Healthcare Financing Committee. Um, and so I had seen a fellow legislator who had filed this bill in 2015, 2016, who then left the legislature. Uh, and I picked it up and ran with it because I thought it was critically important to get it passed. I have a daughter with two chronic diseases. And while uh, neither disease is rare on its own, uh, the combination of having them together is rare. And so uh, as a mother and as a caregiver to somebody who's very invested in the healthcare uh, side of the world, this, this was really important for me as a legislator to work on and to get passed. Great, thank you. Well, we really appreciate you being here with us today. Um, Jacob, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jacob Fraker. Uh, as I said, I'm the Senate staffer for Senator Susan Eggman here in California. Um, my connection to rare disease, uh, both my brother and I have cystic fibrosis. Um, so I'm very familiar with what it's like to be a patient as well as a caretaker of someone with rare disease. Um, yeah, that's why it was so vitally important, uh, at least from my perspective, to really get this uh, champion, really get this through the legislator and make sure that our rare disease community here in California has a voice and seat at the table. Yeah, thank you so much, Jacob. Julie, would you like to go next? Sure. So I am the mother of an almost 25-year-old born with the rare disease, congenital hyperinsulinism. And so I've gone through that kind of life experience 
of dealing with a disease that causes the overproduction of insulin, congenital hyperinsulinism, and that can cause brain damage or death if it's not treated in a timely manner and there isn't a uh, FDA approved treatment for his type of hyperinsulinism, which meant removing his pancreas, which brought on a host of other conditions and issues. And that experience led me to join other parents to form Congenital Hyperinsulinism International to support patients wherever they are in the world. But that journey led me to state advocacy. And through NORD, about nine years ago, I started connecting with other rare disease advocates in the state. And uh, starting back in 2015, there was some legislation introduced for a rare disease advisory council. And uh, then it got lost. And um, kind of with, there was so much other important legislation going on. And, but now it's back and we're raring to go and to get it passed. That's great. Thank you. Well, I'm really excited to kick this off. Appreciate you all sharing your backgrounds and your connection to the rare disease community. Next, I'd like to move in to talk a little bit more about the RDAC advocacy process, why we're all here today. So uh, let's start with you, Representative Kane. Can you talk a little bit more about your role as a Massachusetts state legislator and what it means to be the lead sponsor of the Massachusetts, or what it meant to be the lead sponsor of the Massachusetts RDAC bill? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so my role as a legislator, as again, I alluded to earlier on, uh, when I heard this bill come before our Joint Committee on Public Health the first time, I immediately thought it was incredibly necessary to happen uh, and wanted to help see that happen. Uh, and when my colleague decided not to run for re-election uh, as a legislator, another colleague of mine um, whose family has a history of hemophilia, and I decided to co-file this together. And you know, as a legislator, um, you know, part of our role is to also think through how to work with advocacy organizations to uh, best set this bill up for success. Uh, every state is different, but in Massachusetts, we tend to have 6,000 bills filed every legislative session, which is a two-year period of time, and a very small percentage of those, uh, somewhere between 4 and 6% actually become law. So you really have to work hard to find a path um, for your bill uh, to get through. It's very rare for a bill to get through the first time. So, you know, we were fortunate having had it heard already once in committee. Um, and this time we really focused on uh, more on the relationship side and bringing all of the different advocacy organizations together. So not just uh, the, the patient and caregiver piece and wonderful organizations like NORD and, and uh, the Rare Action Network here, but also uh, life sciences uh, and healthcare institutions and to get them also helping us to, uh, to leverage uh, the importance of this bill with key relationships uh, that were in the path of uh, determining whether or not this bill became law. And so that was a lot of our focus this past session. That's great. Thank you, Representative Kane, for that background. Um, and I'm so sorry, Mike, I, I'd like to go back to you for a second too. Sorry, you cut off on my screen. Would you be able to introduce yourself as well and talk about your connection to RARE and why you're helping lead the California Rare Disease Advisory Council bill? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Hu. Uh, I'm in Northern California. Uh, about 10 years ago, two of my uh, three boys were diagnosed with a regenerated disease called uh, mucopolysaccharidosis type 2 or MPS2. You might have heard it as Hunter syndrome. It's a systemic uh, metabolic disease. They uh, lack a critical enzyme to break down some big sugar molecules in their bodies. So those big sugar molecules starts to build up and eventually affects functions all around the body. Uh, especially leading to um, developmental delay and uh, premature death. Um, I've started advocacy from about 10 years ago, and I think it's about two years ago I started working with Nord um, and eventually uh, take on the role of uh, volunteer state ambassador. I think there's a lot of uh, within state advocacy work that we need to do. There's a lot of um, legislative actions impacting the rare disease communities that are actually happening at the state level. Uh, so it's also important to uh, focus on that. And, and RDAC, um, I think, is 
long needed in the California state. Um, as a parent, uh, of course, we've been having various challenges and it's not just uh, medical challenges. Uh, there's a lot of support challenges that we're not getting from the uh, you know, uh, government agencies and whatnot, uh, mostly because they have not heard of these various rare diseases before. And so I think having an RDAC, having our voice being heard, having the educational sources available to everyone, I, I, I think it's really a piece that's uh, very important. So, um, you know, when my uh, long-term friend, uh, advocacy friend reached out to me and said, hey, should we start this? Uh, I immediately said, yes, we should do it. <laughs> so that's where I start. That's great. Thank you so much, so much, Mike. Um, we're really excited to dive more into the California effort today. Um, heading back to the legislative side of things, um, Representative Kane, you did a great job talking about what it means to be a legislator and what it means to be the sponsor of an RDAC bill. Um, but on the other side of the legislative process are also the hardworking policy staff that help support our lawmakers every day. Representative Kane, it was amazing to work with your office. Um, they were always very committed to helping the rare disease community and, and helping uh, to give NORD and other patient organizations guidance as we you know, helped advance the RDAC through the legislature. Jacob, you know, you're a Senate staffer and you also have been just such a tremendous help in California and we appreciate all that you do. Um, along with Senator Eggman. Can you discuss what your role has been thus far in the California RDAC process and why you're so passionate about creating an RDAC for the state of California? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, obviously my passion uh, comes from my community, right? As a member of the rare disease community, um, as a brother to someone in the community, it is, you know, incredibly impactful and important for me that, you know, the voice of this community is heard at all levels, right? Not just at the state level, but all the way down to school boards and all the way up to the federal level. So uh, this is work that I've been passionate about for a long time. Um, and so my role in this is um, we, I actually worked with Susan. Susan's mother uh, had a rare disease and she is a caretaker of her wife who has, you know, some severe chronic diseases. And so Susan is very uniquely, you know, I think fits into the community and understands a lot of the needs that we have in our day-to-day -day lives. So we actually brought this bill forward last year uh, in the beginning of 2020. Uh, I wrote the bill myself in collaboration with some of the coalition members and looking out at other states to see what they had done and what we thought we could improve on and what we thought we really wanted to instill from other states. We brought the bill, and unfortunately, you know, due to the pandemic, uh, it didn't make it through the legislature. A lot of our packages were cut. Um, I will say Senator Eggman continued to champion this, and in the beginning of the pandemic, we thought it was even more important uh, that we have a voice for the rare disease community uh, in place as we kind of move through this recovery and response to the pandemic. You know, certainly in making sure that rare disease patients are prioritized when it comes to PPE, when it comes to going back to school, when it comes to vaccine distribution, we wanted to make sure that rare disease patients had a direct line to the people making those decisions in order to inform them and make the best decisions for our community. Uh, so while we were unable to bring it back uh, or bring it forward in, in that years, uh, Senator Eggman, you know, vowed to bring it back her first year. Coming back from the uh, legislature at the time, she was an assembly member. She is now a state senator, and this was one of the first bills that she brought back. Uh, she understands, you know, the critical importance of having this. Um, and in that, we've, you know, our, our DAG looks a little different than some of the other states in that we have both a rare disease advisory council, and we also have a rare disease ombudsperson within the Department of Health and Human Services. We thought this was crucial to ensure that the, the work and the burden that the council kind of takes on it and moving forward a lot of these pieces is not bore you know, solely by the patients, but that we would have you know, someone nine to five, Monday through Friday in the department working to advocate and push forward the agenda of the council, as well as having a touch person uh, for any department, any school, any legislator to reach out and say, we have some questions about the rare disease community or, you know, we would like to be able to help and are wondering to know how to get involved. 
And so we have two kind of different components that um, some of the other states don't have, and but we think it's incredibly crucial to get both of those pieces through, um, so that you know the council is supported, you know, nine to five, Monday to Friday, and that that ombudsperson is also right. There's four million, approximately four million people with rare diseases in California. That's a lot for one person to handle, uh, and so we want to make sure that they and themselves are supported by a broad stakeholdership of people in the rare disease community, not just patients, but doctors, hospitals industry, insurance, you know, when we tackle the issues of rare disease patients, they are so intersectional, right? Any, any one of our issues touches on three different, at least three different places. And so it's important that everyone is at the table when we're talking about the problems in the rare disease community, everyone who contributes to that problem inadvertently or not, we want them at the table. And we also want everyone at the table who is part of the successes of the rare disease community. When we look at treatments that are coming down, when we look at advocacy, we wanna make sure that you know all those components are there as well. So that as they're trying to work through how to address these issues, everyone's at the table and is supported throughout the process, not just the council itself, but with the ombudsperson and the legislator as well. So that's just a little bit about you know California's uh, effort in this movement. That's great. Thank you so much, Jacob. That was really helpful and gave some insight into what the California RDAC looks like. You know, on the other side of the advocacy process, as we work through these RDACs in several states, are amazing advocates um, like Julie and Mike, who are working alongside the coalition um, to help advocate for an RDAC. So, Julie and Mike, let's start with each of you. Can you talk a little bit about your role and where you're currently at in your RDAC process? Sure. Um, Julie, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. Yes, um, I'd love to. So as I said, I got involved through NORD in rare disease advocacy in New Jersey nine years ago. And having that experience year in and year out, developing a rare disease day program led to having really deep relationships and ties with many of the stakeholders in the state. And um, so that includes everybody from the people working for the professional organizations like BioNJ and the Healthcare Institute of New Jersey to the clinicians and the researchers and the caregivers and the patients. And so when, um, when Nord, I think it was in 2019, when you came to me and said, let's get this bill going. <laughs> Um, I had this great group of people to go to, and we started having meetings, and we looked over the original bill from 2015, and then we compared it to, we did, Rose was so helpful, um, remember you made that wonderful chart that looked at all of the different RDACs that were either had been passed or were in development. And we looked at all the aspects of every part of the bill, um, looking at um, the composition, looking at the duties. And we had really deep discussions, um, not so much arguments, but deep discussions about what we should put in the RDAC. And through this, all of the different people involved in this, in this planning committee kind of developed some passion around it, which was great. And then we connected with the legislators and it was really helpful to work even with lobbyists on that because they have the relationships with the legislators. And through our Rare, Rare Disease Day events from the prior years, we had developed relationships with legislators, with their staff members. Uh, so the process has been really, uh, really interesting and we, you know, as we go through it and as the bill, which now has passed the committees, the health committees in, in each of the houses, um, it is, it's so we're, we're going places with it and we have broad bipartisan support. Um, it passed unanimously in both the committees. So I think just today we had our New Jersey Rare Disease Day event and we had lots of legislators and many stakeholders and there was all this excitement about why we need this bill. And I think it's gonna pass soon. <laughs> and um, it's just got momentum now. Yeah, no, it's really, really exciting news in New Jersey. Thank you for that background, Julie. It's been it's been a pleasure to, to help advance that in New Jersey. Um, Mike, let's turn it over to you for a second. Can you talk a little bit about where California is in their legislative process? Yeah, um, we... 
currently have so Jacob actually knows more details. We have the bill submitted and it's uh, scheduled to have uh, health committee hearings uh, actually next week. Uh, so we're in the process of preparing for that. We rounded up the supports from our coalition members and submitted the support letter actually yesterday. Um, so that's where we are. We So far we have seen pretty good momentum behind uh, the coalition. We have, I think, uh, very supportive uh, coalition member organizations, uh, individuals, and we have received uh, pretty good feedback and support from legislators as well. Uh, one thing that what Julie mentioned uh, really resonates is uh, the connections uh, that are super important. I think um, during this process, um, you know, obviously, it, it's not born out of nowhere. A coalition uh, is built based on personal trusts and connections and, you know, uh, common goals and all that that bound us together. So uh, I've been advocating for about 10 years now and our coalition members have all been, you know, seasoned uh, advocates, which, you know, uh, one way or another has brought us together in previous uh, advocacy events and you know we've all built a trust and uh, uh, camaraderie if you will uh, and we have uh, common goals of passing this legislation so uh, I think that's one of the bigger motivations behind the momentum uh, from all uh, participants that you know that the 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 uh, now that it's hopefully happening, uh, let's give it a further push. That's great. Thanks, Mike. Um, as you talked about, there's been diverse coalitions pushing for the creation of these councils across our country. Um, you know, not just in New Jersey and in California, um, in every state that's worked on an RDAC, there's a group pushing it of dedicated patients and advocates just like Mike and Julie. So in our last toolkit, um, we titled Creating an RDAC in Your State, we covered this and, you know, went into some more detail about how to start your coalition and who should be on your coalition and how do you go about starting that process. And then as Anissa covered, as one of the first steps in the legislative advocacy process is working with advocates alongside their coalition to fill out the model language. And as Anissa touched on, you know, that's the template language that legislators start with um, and then use it to customize to, feed their, to meet their state's needs. So, you know, we as NORD see the main parts of the legislation as the council duties, you know, what the council works on, the council membership, who actually is serving on the council. Um, just to name a few. So um, I'd like to talk about this this part of the process a little bit more. We really see, you know, customizing the legislation to meet that state's rare disease community needs as something that's really important during this advocacy process. So Representative Kane, can you give some more insight into that process for our participants today into, you know, how that works with drafting legislation and how you help tailor the legislation to meet Massachusetts needs? Sure, absolutely. Um, and so I think this is an area where um, advocates, um, when there is a legislator or legislators who have decided to file this language, um, there needs to be some um, willingness to understand that there is give and take in the legislative process. And so while there may be a model of language that you're starting from, um, as bills move through committees in Massachusetts, ours move through both the Public Health Committee and then the Healthcare Financing Committee, and then it went to the Ways and Means Committee, um, you know, all along the way, there are opportunities for the language to be tweaked. Um, and so there needs to be some flexibility and also an awareness that um, in order to have bills move through the legislative process, you need to gain um, some acceptance from key folks along the way. And so there will be negotiations at times around things. And I think um, understanding that's going to happen is, is part of the process and not something that should upset folks. But, you know, as long as you're making forward progress, um, and, and you're keeping the philosophical intent so that we are getting out of it what we need, um, but also giving a little where there's an opportunity to get some additional buy-in. For example, in our state, um, you know, when I think when it was first filed, it had 21 members. It then in a future year, we filed it with 27 members. And in the end, we came up with 29 members. Um, and, you know, one of my colleagues wanted to add a dietitian to the membership. And I was like, 
Absolutely. That's, you know, perfectly fine with me. Uh, at another point when I was uh, gaining the assistance of the majority leader who has been involved in any piece of health care uh, legislation in our state moving, uh, he had suggested that perhaps the governor shouldn't have the majority of the appointments, but that perhaps the Senate president and the speaker should have some as well. And I saw that as another, of course, absolutely, we can do that. And so, again, you know, we kept the who was on the council the same, but we changed um, some of who got appointed by which person. And again, those are things that, you know, didn't harm the legislation in any way, but helped it move through the process. And so I think that's something uh, that we always need to be willing to see. I think your points on what needs to be in um, are correct. I also think it may be important um, about who appoints. So, again, I would think through, is there... Um, is it beneficial to the legislation to have a couple of the different appointing authorities be some of the people who can help uh, move legislation through the process? In my case, having the speaker be one of the appointers worked out really well. Um, and I think also some timelines, right? So um, having some timeframes in there for when the first meeting should occur of the council. If you do it that way, that means by default, um, the members need to be named but to the council in order for that first meeting to happen. And so having some timeframes in there to ensure that this doesn't get passed, but then just sit because there isn't any sense of urgency behind it is important. Um, and so I would say that those are some of the the key points, I would also say that identifying a lead advocacy organization, because again, you know, in my case, um, I'm not in the, the Democratic Party, which has a clear majority here in Massachusetts. I'm in the Republican Party. I have one staffer. Um, and so it was important for me that there be a sort of a lead advocacy organization who could help disperse information out to all the different parties. And so, again, I think recognizing, and, and Jacob could certainly speak to this as well, you know, what works best for the lead sponsor's office in terms of helping for that advocacy piece uh, and, and making sure that it all points along the process in which you need advocates to be weighing in, you know, you, you've got a good way to galvanize and to disperse that information rather than just having to be done all necessarily through the legislator's office. I think that's a great example of partnership between sort of what I call um, internal and external advocates to help with this process. That's great. Thank you, Representative Kane. That was all really helpful insight into the, the nitty gritty of um, how legislation, you know, actually gets through. Julie, um, let's turn to you for a second. You know, I know you, you discussed this a little bit earlier, but you too in New Jersey use Nord's model language as a starting point, um, you know, to help model the New Jersey legislation off of. Can you share with us how you incorporated uh, the New Jersey rare disease community's feedback? Absolutely. So in New Jersey, we think of ourselves as the medicine cabinet to the world because we have so many pharmaceutical and biotech companies. We also have um, very dense urban communities and rural communities. So we have lots of different needs and we have kind of a powerhouse in terms of um, the, the uh, pharmaceutical and biotech industries. So people have a lot of strong opinions and New Jersey just has sort of its special way of doing things. Um, so we also had a lot of discussions about the composition of the council and initially our committee um, saw the need for many different kinds of people to be part of of the council, you know, um, and we looked at, um, you know, physicians, researchers, patients, geneticists, genetic counselors, and then, of course, the legislature, legislatures and Office of Insurance and on and on and on. So we came up with 30 people and, you know, felt really strongly and had long discussions about that. But then there were some amendments because um, the sponsors felt like that was just too many people and you're not going to get anything done with 30. And so then we had to have really deep discussions about, well, who do we drop? And there was lots of back and forth and, and we did it. And so we got it down to, I believe it's 20. So there was a lot of discussion on that. Another big discussion point was where should the council be housed? And um, so I think in the model language, it may have been the Department of Health or initially it was in the Department of Health, but we had some discussion with that and thought that we really wanted 
there to be some flexibility and thought that a research academic institution could in fact potentially be a really good place to house the council because there are many examples of sort of public private think tanks and committees that are often housed in academic institutions and you can get a, a lot of support and interest from academics. So um, we really wanted to, we wanted there to be that possibility, but then we eventually compromised and made that sort of an option in the language so that the Department of Health can name another institution to house the council. Uh, so those were sort of some big important points. And then in terms of the duties, we had a sort of a different kind of way of approaching this and didn't want the council to be hamstrung with a certain very specific set list of deliverables. Um, you know, I have a lot of experience doing this kind of bringing stakeholders together in my disease area and know that there's a lot of really great work that can be done when those who are actually sitting on a committee are deciding together how they're gonna create their prioritized, you know, prioritized agenda. So we wanted to set it up in such a way that there's enough in there to give uh, the council kind of the kind of background and guidance they need, but at the same time, give them the, the space and the flexibility to develop um, their exact um, kind of blueprint. And we think that because we have such strong advocates in New Jersey, there's not going to be a lack of initiative there. So, you know, we feel really good about that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Julie. That's all really helpful. You know, the next uh, step that we recommend in our toolkit after you work on the model legislation with your coalition is identifying a, a legislative sponsor who would be interested in introducing and ultimately supporting the legislation all the way through, like Representative Kane and, and Senator Eggman. So Representative Kane, what advice would you give to advocates and their coalition when looking for a sponsor to champion the RDAC bill? So I would give a few recommendations. Um, I think first and foremost, um, having a connection in some way, um, and certainly you see that Jacob spoke with that in California, not just uh, the senator, but also the staff connection. Um, I think that's really important. I think um, it makes you that much more passionate um, about the legislation if you have a connection to it. Um, I think also ensuring that it's going to be a legislator is one of their top priorities. I mean, this is they're not just going to file it. This is where they're going to put um, their political capital and emphasis behind it um, and really understanding, you know, how to get something passed. That's that's also critical. Um, you can have somebody who's very passionate about this, but if they aren't skilled in moving legislation forward, and, and in particular, public health or, you know, healthcare related legislation, um, you know, sometimes what might make sense is to partner with another. Again, you know, in our state, two of us partnered together. It wasn't necessarily there was a deficiency in either of us. We were both very passionate about it and wanted to work together. Um, but if I had recognized that I wanted to really passionately pursue this, but didn't think necessarily I had the right relationships, I probably would have partnered with another um, legislator who I thought would be beneficial to helping get this across the line. So, and I think most legislators are pretty skilled at understanding and needing in understanding what it's going to take to get something, you know, over the finish line. And so having some of those open dialogues, I think, is critical as part of this. Um, and I would also say, again, you know, it does generally take legislation multiple sessions to pass. Um, and so I think advocates, I think that's a hard, it's definitely hard for legislators. I think, you know, I'm constantly frustrated with the slow pace of things, but sometimes I think advocates it's take it that it means uh, that people aren't seeing the merit in the legislation. And, and that's really hard to explain, but it's critical that people don't get upset if something doesn't move in one legislative cycle. I always tell people it's about incremental progress, you know, and, and so that's a really important part of these, this as well. And so I think you're looking when you ask or when you find a legislator or when a legislator finds you, um, that piece of the evaluation is important too. Are they committed to this over the long haul? You know, if this is going to take a couple cycles, is this something that they're passionate enough about and will place as a top priority that they're committed to that? But this is a relationship business. 
um, the political side of it. And so, you know, it, it does matter that uh, the person who's filing it or the, or the lead team has some of those relationships that you're going to need in order to get this uh, legislation through the whole process. Yeah, thank you, Representative Kane. That's all really helpful. I really like your point, too, about being patient. Um, you know, legislation takes time. So that's a really, really good point. Thanks for sharing that today. Um, you know, after you find a sponsor um, to help move the RDAC bill, um, you often are, are working with the office, as Representative Kane and Jacob talked about, to help advance the legislation. So, Jacob, can you share with our audience today how advocates can be most helpful to legislative staff when pushing for an RDAC? Absolutely. So I, I will say that I'll echo a lot of Representative Kane's comments and that having that flexibility and having that adaptability um, as it works through the process. Um, you know, I think a lot of us would like to just be like, this is such a good idea. Why wouldn't they like it? Um, but it is a process. And so I think one of the most important places for advocacy to plug in uh, is in that partnering and, and reaching out to other legislators, but not just saying, you know, we want this, but being able, but telling your story, right? When we look at legislation, when we look at what moves legislation through, sometimes it's that data piece and it's that cost effectiveness, but what really kind of drives these pieces are the stories of rare disease patients, right? When people really tap into, you know, this is my story, this is what I go through every single day, I think it really invites legislators to, to engage in some empathy and to engage in some understanding of what it can be like for a rare disease patient and the obstacle courses that we run through every day just to get our basic needs met. And so I think, you know, that is such an important piece uh, is, is sharing your story, sharing your narrative, uh, whether it's yours, whether it's a family member's, right, whether it's your child or, or what have you. Um, that is such an important piece. And, and being persistent, too, right? It, it helps uh, to constantly be saying, hey, this is something that's important. Having that flexibility of saying, hey, I don't think it's going to happen this year but like, let's do this next year and, and being there for us as well. I'll say that, that, you know, the California coalition has been just incredibly helpful in workshopping language uh, and being flexible and reaching out to legislators um, and providing that, that personal narrative that I think is so crucial to getting pieces of legislation such as this through the process. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. That's all really helpful. Um, we are running low on time here, so I have one more question for Mike, and then I want to open it up for some of the great questions we've been getting through the Q&A box. Um, Mike, you've done a great job working with your coalition out in California, you know, to help Jacob and prepare for the legislative process. Can you talk about how you um, work to grow your coalition? Uh that is a good question. Uh, I think, uh, so first of all, uh, it's still early in the process, so uh, we cannot claim any victories yet, of course. And I echo what uh, Representative Kane and Jacob has been saying. The, uh, it is a process. It takes time. So we have been working with uh, now Senator Eggman's office for two years now uh, behind the bill. Uh, well, what I have personally found out is um, what's most helpful for from the advocacy side, from the coalition side, really is to start these conversations. It, it is about um, advocating, uh, bringing awareness, and uh, building the connections with the key stakeholders that this is important. I mean, of course, we would think it's important because uh, we live in it, right, day, day in, day out. But they probably don't. And so we need to bring them into our perspectives and understand why it's so important for this part of the community and why we are passionate behind it. Once they buy into that vision, they will become your supporters. And, you know, it's not something that you can, uh, I guess, force onto someone. Uh, and so in building the coalition, uh, you know, we've been hosting events, trying to uh, educate uh, our state advocates with regard to you know what RDAC is and what's the difference between RDAC and, for example, Red Disease Caucus or some of these other um, forms of uh, rare disease, uh, I guess, forces that are you know all helpful, but RDAC is in its own right uh, a very critical piece and why we're behind it. And throughout the sessions, you will see 
you know, there are a lot of confusions out there about, you know, what can we do? What, what, what is our deck about? Why do we need it? Even within the rare disease community. So, you know, we have to do that kind of uh, educational work, if you will, uh, communication again, to bring the awareness to everyone who will even benefit from it. They need to understand it first before they realize it's going to benefit. Um, and so that kind of groundwork, I think, is very important in starting to build it because once more people understand it, um, they have their own network of other advocates and other organizations as well. They're going to spread the word. So we've been seeing the attendance to our uh, RDAC related events. Uh, we're hosting monthly events now. Um, we're seeing the participation to grow. We're seeing more diverse participants as well, which suggests to us, I mean, we're in, in some ways, we, we have our communication channels and it has its own limit in terms of how many we can reach out to the uh, to the community, to the California state constituents. Um, but it is because the other participants, once they are converted into, you know, RDAC is important, they are reaching out to their uh, buddies, their networks and say, hey, you know, this is an important thing. Why don't you come and, you know, uh, you know, support it. So I think that kind of organic growth definitely is benefiting from the groundwork that we have um, worked into. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I'll say too, you know, in California, as Mike has talked about, there is a growing coalition. So if you're on the line from California today and, and want to get more involved, um, please reach out to us at rdac at rarediseases.org and we're happy to put you in touch with the, the coalition out there. Um, so now, um, with about 10 minutes left, I'd like to move into our Q&A session. So please continue putting your great questions in the Q&A box. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. Um, the first question um, is for Representative Kane. Um, can you share how advocates can best monitor the legislative process in their state? It can be a little bit confusing looking from the outside in. So what would you advise advocates to, to do to help in that process? It can be confusing being on the inside too. So um, the most states have um, a way through their website. So for instance, in Massachusetts, we have a way that you can create a sort of track my bills and you can enter bill numbers in and it will um, let you know when there's movement on a bill. Um, I think too, and I mentioned this earlier, it works really well if there's a lead advocacy organization who you're also um, getting emails from that you can rely on, you know, and they would let you know, hey, we need to have people, you know, come in and provide testimony at a hearing or to write in testimony. And, and that's a really helpful way to feel engaged in it. Um, I think too, you know, I, and I think Jacob mentioned this, it does, there doesn't have to be action going on for you to take action. So calling up your local legislators and saying, hey, could I have a few minutes of your time so I can explain why this is so important to me. Um, nothing helps imprint on a legislator or a staff member like a personal story, a personal connection to a bill. And so, um, you know, this is a case where, you know, even if they're not in a legislative session in your state, finding out who your local legislators are and reaching out to them now and letting them know about it. Because again, that also puts it in there and they may be looking for it and listening in a different way. Um, so really do that reach out um, anytime to your local legislators. That's great. Thank you, Representative Kane. Um, the next question um, is for Jacob. Um, have you found in California RDACs to be a pretty bipartisan issue? Yeah, absolutely. We have a rare disease um, legislative caucus as well that is works within the legislator. Uh, it is very bipartisan. You know, I think healthcare generally tends to not be a red and blue issue, but, uh, you know, I think everyone, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, recognizes that people need healthcare to one degree or another. The delivery of that healthcare, maybe there may be some different perspectives, but when it comes to quality care, when it comes to, you know, supporting people in real need in the medical community, that both sides of the aisle agree that you know, there needs to be support here. Um, you know, I, I firmly believe that our bill will have bipartisan support. Uh, I think Representative Kane is a great example of that, that, you know, it's not just a one side issue that both sides really care about these kinds of patients. And, you know, when we look at rare diseases, right, 50 percent 
of rare diseases are, you know, are children. Um, and everybody cares about children. Everybody wants to make sure that those children live long, normal lives. And so it's, it's an easy place to come together. It's an easy place to cross the aisle and say, you know, we stand together in supporting this community. Yeah, thank you so much, Jacob. Um, the next question is for Mike. Um, what is one thing you wish you knew before um, embarking on this RDAC legislative process in California? Um, everything uh, that I didn't know <laughs> and everything I didn't know still. Uh, I, you know, it, it's kind of interesting how we started the coalition. Uh, it, uh, I, I certainly didn't initiate it, if you will. Uh, our coalition co-lead, uh, Siri Base, one day just uh, uh, reached out to me and said, hey, should we do this? And I said, yeah, of course. Uh, I, you know, in some sense, I've been waiting for this to happen. But um, that waiting was because I had no idea how to do this. But I think the most important thing really is to get started. Um, whether you're using the toolkit as your starting point or you're talking to someone as your starting point, the key is to get it started. All of my questions, well, I shouldn't say all of my questions, many of my questions are still unanswered, um, but a lot of them has have been answered along the way because you, if you want to do your homework and say, okay, I know this thing inside out and then I start to do it, that would be too late. That, that would be too late for most anything. So I think the right mindset would be, this is important, let's start figuring out how to do it. Yeah, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, your insight's really valuable. As other folks work on these in their states. Um, Julie, last question for you before we um, go to close it out here. Um, if, you know, the New Jersey effort is, you know, long underway, but is it too late for other patient groups to, to get involved and how would they get involved now? Yeah, no, not at all. Um, the more the merrier, you know, as I said, we had our rare disease day event today in New Jersey and I met new people who are doing incredible work and we want them all to be involved. So you can go to rarenj.org and join the coalition. And from there, you will start getting action alerts and you'll get information about when we're gonna meet again. And um, just like Mike, we are going to be having regular meetings moving forward. And so there are just, you know, our arms are wide open. The, we, we wanna grow this. We want everybody's voice to be heard and to be included. And so just join us. Yes, the more the merrier, right? Um, thank you so much to all of our wonderful panelists for joining us today. We really appreciate your valuable insights as you work on these in your states. This was all really helpful. Um, so I'll take us back and, and close it out today. But again, one more thank you to all of our panelists. So next steps and how to get involved. Um, now that the webinar is almost done, um, how can you request the toolkit that we discussed today? Um, I would encourage you to visit the Project RDAC website. Um, the link is here um, on the screen, but you can also go to rarediseases.org and you can click on it from the home page as well. Um, from there, you'll be able to download the toolkit that we covered advocating for a rare disease advisory council in your state. Um, future Project RDAC opportunities. Um, stay tuned, there's more toolkits coming. Our next one is the implementation toolkit that's focused on what's next after you do this legislative phase and, and you get the work done and you get an RDAC passed and signed into law. So more on that coming this spring. In addition, we'll have a stakeholders meeting in July of this year, so stay tuned for the date on that. But We'll bring together um, stakeholders from across the country working on RDACs um, or who are interested in RDACs. All are welcome to come learn about some of the achievements from this year and more on RDACs at large. Um, in addition, um, it's not too late if you missed our first webinar or other toolkits that we've put out. They're all online on our uh, Project RDAC website. Lastly, um, I would encourage you to join the Rare Action Network to stay up to date on coalition meetings happening in your state. You can do that at rareaction.org. 
And finally, if you have questions after today, please email us at rdac at rarediseases.org. Finally, before I close this out, I want to say a big thank you again to all of our Project RDAC sponsors, Biogen, Bluebird Bio, Bowringer Engelheim, CSL Bering, Horizon, Genentech, Sarepta, Takeda, and Vertex. Thank you all so much for joining us today and hope you have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.